Hi, this is John Femiani, and we're going to be talking about Chapter 11, which is also about operating systems. And in particular, we're going to be talking about file systems and directories, which is going to be useful to you um, when you're using Python in order to pull input from a file or write output to a file or do a lot of the types of things that you might want to do with, with a script, for instance, renaming a whole bunch of files, navigating file systems, deciding where to write and where you are. Um, config files, for instance, um, are, are a case where often you need to save things to a file so that you don't have to ask the user to input them again and again. Um, just in general, um, data in files is an important thing to know how to use. And uh, this chapter's goals are to talk about um, the purpose of files, uh, file systems, and directories. We're going to talk about text versus binary files, which is the source of a gotcha that eventually bites programmers um, if, if they do enough manipulation of files and they don't understand why their file appears to just all of a sudden start giving garbage partway. It could be opened in the wrong mode, for instance. Um, we're going to look at different types of files and uh, in particular we're also going to look at how the file extension is used to indicate the type. Um, there are other ways to indicate the type of a file and uh, what the type of a file means and why it's important. Right? So, um, We're also going to talk about operations that you do on a file and we're going to compare two different modes of accessing a file. Um, the one which you most often use when you're uh, programming is, is sequential access uh, and also we're going to talk about direct file access which uh, can be a, a bit more complicated but it's more powerful especially if you're thinking about things like a database. We're going to discuss the issues related to uh, protection and we're going to give you the concept of a directory tree which when I was coming up everybody just naturally understood uh, but in this age of tablets um, I don't know whether this is uh, necessarily obvious to you that that's how um, most file systems are conceptually organized. Um, we're going to talk about absolute and relative paths, which kind of relate back to this tree analogy for your file system. And uh, we're going to talk about disk scheduling algorithms, which um, in this conversation we're going to be talking about um, the model of the magnetic or the the disk with composed of cylinders. I honestly do not know if the same um, criteria will apply to solid state disks. So, uh, you know, technology keeps changing, which makes it hard to cover um, computer science technology. But uh, we are going to, this is still important, so uh, we're going to be talking about um, disk scheduling algorithms. Uh, to begin with, let's get some terminology out of the way. Uh, we're talking about file systems, um, but let's get some words down. A file uh, is just a named collection of related data and it's used for organizing secondary memory. So this term secondary memory we're using to talk about um, persistent memory, the, the, the memory that survives after you turn your computer off and turn it on again. But more specifically we're talking about disks, right? Um, your CPU has within it um, a, a series of uh, memory caches uh, which are designed to allow you to access the data that you need quickly. Um, that's all considered primary memory. Um, and uh, secondary memory, it, it, the, the whole reason you have these caches is to protect you from the very long access time it takes to get to secondary memory. So secondary memory is, um, it takes much longer to read data from it. That, that can be the bottleneck. Uh, we're going to talk about a file system and what that is is sort of um, on top of your physical disks, which just like memory can be organized in a variety of, of ways, you have the conceptual layout of, of files on your disk, which may not correspond to the, well, it probably won't correspond to the physical location of your data on a disk, but it's the mental analogy that we use to, um, to model the file system on a disk. So we're going to talk about um, th this mental model we have for file systems and uh, key to that mental model is the idea of a directory or grouping so we try to group uh, the files together in semantically meaningful ways um, that forms in most cases a, a hierarchy or a tree
so we'll get to that. Uh, we're going to talk about um, two different types of file. Uh, we're going to talk about, well, basically, you could think about that there's this just general thing. A file could be any binary data, and then you can choose to interpret the records of the file or the, the chunks of data in the file as ASCII characters. Uh, but in fact, this division between text and binary is so common and so fundamental that we're going to kind of treat these as two different categories. So a text file would just be a file that contains characters, uh, typically um, from the ASCII, in, in, and uh, sometimes uh, more and more as Unicode character sets. ASCII, as you're familiar, is the 8-bit um, per character representation of text, where uh, 41 uh, be, is the beginning of, uh, of the lowercase letters, and 61 is the beginning of the uppercase letters in hex. Um, and then Unicode is uh, either a 16-bit or a variable uh, length size representation of text, and um, it's capable of representing characters in other alphabets. So, um, so those would be text files, and the big difference there may be no difference between a text file and a binary file, but one big difference that bites you um, in Windows is that the way the size and the end of the file is represented is different in a text file than it is in a binary file. For instance, in a, if, you, if you tell the operating system or you tell your API when you're going to access a file that I'm reading it as text, um, it'll assume the file ends after it reads the end of file character, so it's delimited. Whereas in a binary file, on Windows at least, um, it assumes that the size of the file is represented in the files, in some metadata for the file. And it, it'll actually keep reading even if it encounters a series of bits, which would be the end of file character. Um, so a binary file, the idea here is that it just contains data in some specific format. So you can, in a, in a binary file, you, you read as many bytes usually is his interpretation of its bits, but usually things are set up to move uh, bytes or words or some chunk of data at a time uh, from the file into memory. An aside here, it's not discussed in this chapter, but I, I would like to point it out to you. Uh, most of the time when you program it, pro programmatically accessing files, the files are buffered, which means that when I say I want to open a file for reading, the operating system keeps track of a list of open files um, so that I can quickly locate them on on the disk just for efficiency, right? So it, and but not only that, um, very often for those open files, it um, it has a cache, it has a buffer. So um, every time I go to read from the file, it doesn't have to go back to disk and transfer data from disk um, into memory. It just it anticipates your needs and and loads some of it very often, not always, in into a buffer. Um, so for a text file, if you're reading from it sequentially, that buffer um, can maybe be easier to manage than, than other cases, but still, when you're reading stuff, it's going to advance, it's going to pull in a, a bigger chunk at a time into, into that buffer. I just wanted to point that out. Um, it's another thing that impacts the way you deal with files. So text and binary files, the idea of a text file um, is is that it's really a binary file and you're interpreting 8 or 16 bit, if it's ASCII or Unicode, um, chunks of data as characters. In a binary file, um, you, you often can imagine that you've got some data structure that specifically lays out where different fields are in, in memory, and it could be an array, an arbitrary array or, or a record, whatever, but, but every field has some byte offset from the beginning of the data structure. Similarly, in, in these binary files, you imagine you've got some set of records and every piece of data stored in the file, just like you would in, in, when, when you're representing a record in memory, every record in the file has some byte offset from the beginning of the file. And the same thing is true if you want to put an array into a binary file. You might have records that are all the same size and you can jump forward so many bytes into the, into the file. So you can, in, in practice, kind of jump around. Um, you could also do the same thing for text files. Um, so there's a difference between what's stored in the file and how you access it. So you could try to read each character one at a time, or you can jump around. It doesn't matter whether it's binary or text, but, um, but uh, you need to know where you're going to jump to, right? So for text files, you, it may be harder to predict where you're going to go than with a binary file. It all depends on what's stored in the file. Speaking of what's stored in the file, 
um, you've, every file we say it has a type, which is a semantic type. Um, what data is stored in that file? What kind of information is contained in a document? And, um, and so using that, if you know what type of thing is in, in the file, it, it helps you know how to interpret its contents, right? So this information about what type of information is stored in the file, um, there's different ways it could be represented. Usually the operating system, in, in addition to the file itself, maintains some metadata about the file. And, and so that metadata, um, depending on the operating system, could include things like who has access to the file, an icon for the file, you know, various things. Um, but also um, it could can tell you what the type of that file is or how to determine the type. But um, one classic way, you know, that Windows systems very often use, and you even see it in Linux, although Linux has another way of managing the type too, I believe, is that you actually put one important piece of metadata right in the file's name, which is in the extension. So what you tend to do is the, la the last period of the file name. Files can have multiple periods in their name. But the last period of the file name um, separates something called a file extension from the rest of the file name. Um, unfortunately, there's no consensus about whether the name includes the extension or the name is everything before the period, um, which, which means that some APIs are difficult to understand. I wish there was a common term for this. But um, so the file extension is the part that um, follows the last period. And generally, that file extension gives you metadata right there in the name. And that metadata tells you what type of thing is in the file. Right? So this is the only way that it's often done in Windows. Um, other systems also, they'll use something called a magic. So for instance, if you have an image file, very often the type of image file or the different compression settings used or whatever would be contained in the first 16 bits of the file. So you could put the metadata right there in the file's contents and then use that to determine the type. And that's used by some systems as well. Uh, but for let's consider the example many of us use, which is done in Windows and it carries over to operating systems even when there's other ways to do this, which is to put that metadata here in an extension. So I think we generally know that if a file name ends in .txt, it's going to contain text data. Now, I've said that Windows uses these extensions, but um, another thing to point out is that Windows, modern versions of Windows, often try to hide the file's extensions from you. So when you're using the Windows graphical user interface, you may not see the fact that it's a .txt file, that the name has a .txt. So if there's a readme.txt in a, in a directory, you might just see the word readme and a little icon that indicates that it's text. If you look around, there's some way to uh, prevent the operating system from hiding the extensions, and then it'll show you that it's a .txt file. It's important to understand that behind the scenes, that .txt is there in the name, because when you're programmatically trying to create these, these things, or when you want to maybe create a batch file or something that you can run as a script that your operating system knows how to interpret, or if you want to change the interpretation of a file, um, you really need to change access this part of the file name. Um, so here's some example text for text. MP3 is the classic audio. Wave is less compressed usually audio format. Um, GIF, TIFF, and JPEG and PNG are, are different image files. For instance, DOCX is what they use now. Is a and and WP3. Um, these are different document word processing documents. RTF. Um, HTML even, right, it would be different ways to represent formatted text. Java, C, so you get these different ideas, right? Um, so here we can see some files and you can ask yourself, you can tell just from the extension what type of file the thing is going to be. And if you know what type of file it is, then you also know what tool you want to open it with. So you might open this with Word or um, OpenOffice. This one may be with GIMP and this one and uh, these two maybe with Audacity, right? So you'd use different tools for different things. Okay. So um, now imagine, so you've got this idea that there's this thing called a file. Um, it's stored permanent, persistent data. So you can save it between when you turn the computer off and on, on a disk usually somewhere. Um, and then, you, you know, what might you want to do with one of these things, right? So 
You can think about what type of operations you might want to perform. You could pause it and think about it. I'll, I'll just do this myself. Right? I'm going to want to open the file. And of course, open the file means um, tell the operating system that I'm about to use it so that it can set up whatever metadata it needs. So for instance, if there is a buffer or a cache, it can set that up. It can give me a handle so that it can quickly locate the position of that file on the disk. Right? So, so you get a handle, right? So open that file. Um, and then I also might want to close that file, which means release all of those resources because generally your operating system can only handle so many simultaneously open file handles at a time efficiently. So, so open and close is one. I, I might want to read some bytes of data from a file, or I might want to write some bytes of data from a to a file. Um, I might want to erase a file. I might want to rename a file. I might want to move it to a different location. Um, so, I mean, you can think about all those different operations you might want to do to a file. And um, perhaps in a different video, I will show you how to do those through Python. Um, as maybe well as well as through a terminal on, on Windows, which is the system I'm on here. So um, file access. So when you are going to maybe read or write to a file, uh, there are different patterns of access. And um, just like with when we talked about memory and paging and things like that, um, it you have to move stuff from the file into memory and if you can predict what has to be moved from secondary you know from the disk to, me to your primary memory um, then you can kind of buffer that and have it ready already when you need it for instance right so um, for instance sequential access is the same type of access that a linked list would provide versus an array so the idea is you have some current position and when the next thing that you're going to read is going to be um, the, the, if you're at position 20, the next thing you read is going to be at offset number 21. Right? So you're moving forward through the file or maybe backward through the file, but you're accessing the file um, nearby a current um, file position at each time. So uh, this is kind of coherent access. Uh, which which um, could have some benefits uh, accessing in a linear fashion, right? Um, which could have some benefits if you wanted to be able to efficiently buffer or cache, so that you don't your program doesn't have to stop and wait for file to come in, because you can pre uh, maybe fetch the data, for instance. Direct access is where you um, you can jump to any offset in the file, and um, Usually, I mean, some sometimes direct access is provided, and you have to do the arithmetic if I want to go so many bytes into a file. So usually, the size of a record might be eight bits or a byte. Um, but in some systems, when you open the file, um, you tell it how big a record is, and then if you want to jump forward seven, it jumps forward seven times the size of a record. Right. So you could have this notion of oh, every single record, for instance, a lidar file, li la laser scanning file, um, every single record. Um, always has an X and a Y and a Z and um, a red and a green and a blue value and so each one of those takes 32 bits so you know exactly how big a record is and you can jump back efficiently back and forth between any set of records which is efficient because at any given point there's only a small subset of those points that, that would be visible on a screen so so direct access is that kind of scheme it may be a database um, um, where you don't want to pull the whole database in at once, but you want to pull in some chunks might give you direct access. Conceptually here is an image for sequential file access. The idea is you do have a current file pointer, and the next thing you read or write is going to move that file pointer forward. And sometimes you have a put back, which um, will uh, push stuff back into the file. So, um, here I think you can imagine you can easily imagine how a queue might be used. Um, you might want to try to keep some buffer full, some circular buffer maybe full, by pulling data from the disk so it's already ready when you go to read from it. Um, reading from a file is just like reading from the keyboard. If I were to try to read and the stuff isn't loaded from secondary memory yet, then my process gets put into a waiting state until um, that data is read in and maybe put in my buffer and then my process becomes ready again and I can move the file 
I can keep moving forward in, in reading things. All right. So this would be sequential file access. This would be um, direct file access. Uh, you can still, you still generally, um, the analogy is you do have a current file position. It's just you can seek to any other position in the file. You're not limited to moving forward or, or backwards. I, I can seek back to the beginning. I can seek all the way to the end. I can seek some offset away from my current, or I can seek some offset away from the beginning. So you have this ability to seek is the word, to seek um, to a new, a new point and, and make that be the new current file pointer. You can jump around. Right? So the question here is which file access do you think is easier to implement, um, sequential or direct access? I'll let you guys think about that and maybe post something on a discussion forum about it. Um, a good a good way to um, get into the details is to imagine what's going on behind the scenes when I want to get the next piece of information and um, what what might be the drawbacks. Imagine, remember that you've got your primary, your, your fast memory and your slow memory, your secondary memory. And the big issue is uh, trying to avoid um, spending too much time waiting. So another issue here is file protection. Um, so file protection is about uh, controlling who has access to the data in the file. Um, there are a bunch of different ways this could be done. So generally some information is kept as metadata for the file um, indicating who has permission to do what and hopefully that's kept in a secure way. Um, and uh, so your operating system itself, this would be in addition to if you're going to somehow compress or encrypt or password protect it. Uh, this is just talking about who has permission to just open the file. Once you've opened it, you can also do something to the contents of the file itself to, to control who has access to it. But, but this is just about who has permission from the operating system to even read, read from it. Um, so here we've got things, so if you have multiple users, then you kind of want to worry, you have a little bit of privacy. Um, and there's different ways this could be done. Um, the way that it would be done on, say, a Linux-based system um, is in the metadata for the file, you keep track of um, an octal, a three-digit octal number, really. So what we have here is there are three categories. This is just for the Linux system and, and other similars, I suppose. You can either read, you can write, which includes deleting the file, or you can execute the file. So read, write, and execute. Um, and each one of those has a Boolean variable associated with it. Can you read it, can you write it, and can you execute it? And in Linux, every file is given an owner, not necessarily the creator, but an owner, um, a group. So it belongs to a single group, but groups can be can share individuals and and so forth. So you can manage groups separately, but every file is it belongs to a group, and then you have permissions that anybody, any random person who stumbles stumbles across this file, right? So um, for for these different classes of people, the the single individual who owns it, the group of individuals which the file belongs to, or the world. Um, they have different sets. So, uh, for instance, the owner and the group can read from this file, but random other people can't do anything. So each one of these can be considered a, a bit. And in Linux, there's a command called chmod, chmod, that lets you um, change the permissions. And you can also view the permissions uh, for owner, group, and world. And very often with chmod, they set these permissions using an octal or a base 8 number. And the way that that number is constructed is you have read, write, and execute as bits. So this would be a 1, 1, 0, or in, in binary that corresponds to a 6. So this would be a 6, and then a 4, and then a 0. So in, in base 8, because 3 bits is 8, you have 640. So you would do chmod 640 in the file name. Um, and you, you often see that being done on Linux file systems. And in particular, uh, if you ever want to execute a file on, on Linux, they'll say chmod 777, which would let everybody do everything. Um, 
and maybe that's not a good idea. But but that would let you execute it, right? Um, so um, similarly, uh, you know these these files they're they're just just like memory, right? It's just patterns of, of bits, and they're saved somewhere on some persistent storage medium. Could be a solid state drive, could be you know your magnetic disks and hard drives or whatever, right? So, but that's that's fine. Uh, it's stored there, and then your operating system or your drivers, or your hardware somehow know how to know how to go there, grab those bits and piece them together into a file. Right? So th there's all of that. So it's so your files are not really um, in trees in persistent storage. However, um, the the long-standing tendency is for file systems to conceptually organize the files in a tree. And the way that that works is um, we have a special file called a directory um, that contains within it um, a, a metadata for other files that would be contained in that directory. And of course, those other files themselves could be directories. So you can have directories inside directories. So this idea of containment, recursive containment, gives you inherent, implicitly a hierarchy or a tree. So th this gives you a directory tree. All right, so here, here we see an example. You might have a directory called addition3 and then a subdirectory, a directory within this directory called pp slides. And then within there, you might have um, these files could actually be PowerPoint files instead of directories. So chapter1.ppt, chapter7.ppt, etc. Your leaf nodes generally would be files in this directory tree. Um, you see these directory trees when you open up um, something like Windows Explorer. Let me open up one on my computer and pull it into where you can see it. So here's the PowerPoint slide bank, and if you look on the left, um, these are directories. They're generally shown as manila folders, and inside of directories you can have other directories, and inside of those directories you can have other directories or files, and then those files.py would be the extension for a Python file. So, so that's how things are organized. Um, some terminology here borrowed in, in some sense from trees. The parent directory would be the containing directory. So um, at any given point, you can imagine in a file system, uh, this is important, you have a current uh, or a working directory. And uh, the, unfortunately, that term isn't here. But uh, uh, a directory a file system very often maintains a little bit of context because when you're at a terminal or you're doing something, um, there's this notion that you're in a current directory. And um, given the current directory, that directory might have a parent directory, the directory which it is contained in. And, and usually there's a single directory you're contained in. Um, there's a thing called symlinks or links uh, that are used in some file systems which can confuse this, but even in that case, um, there's one of the directories which is considered to be the owning parent, the real parent directory, even if that, even if symlinks kind of hid that fact. And now I'm going to have to explain symlinks. Um, so the idea of a symlink is it's a file that tells you, um, hey, this file isn't actually in the directory, but I'm going to make it look like it's in this directory. So if you try to access this file, it's actually going to go to some other directory to get it, right? So. Um, that's probably a horrible explanation. Um, you can guys can go on the discussion and try to see if you can find a better explanation for symlinks. Um, so the parent directory would be the containing directory, and then the subdirectory would be a directory inside the parent directory, and of course the tree that is constructed based off of these parent and child relationships is a directory tree. A root directory is a directory at the highest level, and uh, on Windows the idea is that you have multiple roots. So uh, Windows has this concept of a drive. And so the C drive has its own root, which begins with a slash here, right? So C colon, um, and then underneath C colon, you have its own directory tree. Okay? Um, D colon, A colon, B colon used to be floppy drives, right? You have their own directory trees. Now you could imagine that maybe there's some machine thing up here that's not shown that would be the root. But in Windows, we call these, we imagine it's got multiple roots. Uh, and then under that root, you have folders, Windows, My Documents, and Program Files. And under My Documents, you might have letters, 
um, like cancelmag.doc or john.doc or applications would be a folder with v, VA Tech and MIT and Cal State.doc. Not this is in the it's a coincidence that my name is John. Um, this is from the, the slide deck. I, 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 I'm not applying to those places. Um, so the uh, so this is an example of a tree. It's presented a little bit funny because some of the child relationships